you that your blood was spilled for every heart, for every person. God, we just pray tonight. We pray tonight. Jesus, that you would bring... Hey, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are excited and grateful that you've chosen to worship with hope. I'm Dan. And I'm Rachel, and we are looking forward to kicking off 2021 by getting in the Gospels together from now until Easter Sunday, which is actually just around the corner. So we've put together a 90-day reading plan for the Gospels. You can access it on our resources page of our app and website. So one of our core values here at Hope is to be biblically engaging, and this is just one way that we are seeking to do that together. So whether you've read the Bible before or you're brand new to scripture, we invite you to dive in with us. Thanks again for joining us. Let's worship. Good morning, everybody. Would you stand and join us? We're gonna sing out together and worship this morning. Let's sing through every battle. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, oh I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth. tells us that he's the one that makes all things new. Let's sing out together.
this be our prayer. Here I am, Lord, come to me, Lord, come to me. Open hands, ready to receive, ready to receive. Can barely stand, Lord, I'm weak, oh, I am weak. Don't understand, but you are what I see. Wherever you are, I invite you to take a seat. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name's Pete Boel, and I'm your host for this morning. And in this time, we're reminded so much that we need one another, and I uh, invite you to join me in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, that we are never alone that you promise that the one that is in us is greater than the one that is in the world or all the voices that we hear in the world. So Lord, we pray for your reassurance this morning, for your peace, for a sense of your presence. We pray for those things that burden our hearts or preoccupy us and keep us from you. We pray that you would remind us through your spirit that we are at our best when we are near to you. So Lord, keep us close. Be with those that are lonely. We pray for your healing for the sick, for your strength for the weak, and for your hope for those that are in despair. 
Lord, we need you. And we thank you that you have called us together this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to share with you this morning that I think the Bible has a lot to say with one anothering. It talks about loving one another, encouraging one another, praying for one another, confessing to one another, serving one another. We are meant to be together. And yet so many of us feel alone. So many of us wonder if anybody knows what we're feeling or maybe that we are just barely making it. Well, no one's going to know that or no one's going to be able to encourage you unless you find someone, unless you decide, I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to take a chance and perhaps join a group. So we're inviting you this morning to join a group. We are beginning registration today for our small groups and even our smaller, a little bit larger groups like Financial Peace or Thrive, which is our ministry for women. And we would invite you to join us in one of our groups. Uh, they run about six to eight weeks. They're going to go right till Easter. So if you're not comfortable in that group, or maybe you don't even like someone in that group, you're going to have an out by Easter. But we would encourage you to join a group. So again, registration begins today. They run six to eight weeks. And if you want to register, you can go on our website at hopecentral.com backslash groups and know that there's a group for everyone. I'm very close to some of the folks that uh, work in our groups ministry here at Hope, and they are great people. And they would love to talk to you or answer any questions you would have. So I would encourage you today to be with one another. That's the way we were meant to be. So God bless you. And let's continue our worship now with an opportunity to give. I believe that uh, in giving, that's a part of our worship as we give of ourselves, as we give of our offering. And so there's opportunities to give in many ways here at Hope. You can text to give or give online uh, or even uh, write a check and send it in to us. So thanks for uh, being here this morning and God bless you and have a great rest of the day. I gave my life to purchase yours, presented myself an offering to atone your sin, endured your curses to set you free, shed my blood to blot out your guilt, bore your condemnation to satisfy divine justice. In the supper, I remember his eternal love, boundless grace, infinite compassion, agony, cross, redemption, and receive assurance of pardon, adoption, life, and glory. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. As we are moving along in our Remember Sermon series, I just wanted to begin by letting you know, if you hadn't seen our communications, that we will be participating in communion this morning, and there's an at-home communion guide if you hadn't seen those communications yet on our website and on our app. So welcome, and we're glad you're with us today. I wanna let you know also a couple of quick things. First of all, thanks for the well wishes regarding how we've had to make adjustments last week. We did have some people on our tech team who had COVID exposure. We're trying to be cautious and wise about that. Fortunately, we have come through that reasonably well, and it has pressed us to come up with a lot of new creative solutions. So I am live today on January 24th, and you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, how do we know if he's actually live? So let me see, what can I tell you? It was 19 degrees when I got in my car this morning and drove over to Hope Church at about 6.30 a.m., and it's a beautiful, cold, brisk winter day. So welcome. I want to let you know also, next weekend we have a special guest who's going to be with us. Andrew and Noreen Brunson are missionaries who have served with our denomination. They were in Turkey for many years. You may have heard Andrew's story. He was imprisoned unjustly for two years in a Turkish prison with no connection to the outside world. He was released after many diplomatic efforts in 2018. And we have the pleasure of having Andrew and Noreen with us next weekend. So we hope you're going to join us on Sunday morning. So remember this theme in the scriptures. 
God tells his people repeatedly to remember, remember, remember. And he does this so that we would remember him, remember his faithfulness, remember his goodness, remember who we are. Also, God tells us repeatedly in the Bible that he remembers. The Bible tells us many times, God says, I remember my covenant with you. I will never forget you. And this idea of remembering is a significant biblical and important idea. Let's back up for a minute and realize how much remembering has to do with core relational aspects. Some things we say to people we love. I love you. I miss you. Don't forget me. I'll be back real soon. These are the kinds of things we say when we have a deep, heartfelt relationship. What we're trying to say to one another is, I love you dearly. Don't forget that I love you. And don't forget me. And this is the core of what an intimate relationship has wound into its center. So God does tell his people to remember. Today we're going to come to the communion table particularly and talk about what this all means with regard to remembering. Remembering Jesus, remembering who he is, remembering what he's done for us. In some respects, my message this morning is really a teaching on communion and what it all means for the richness of who we are in God's family and remembering. Communion is a sacred sacrament. It's both sobering and celebrational. It's magnificent in its expansiveness through God's redeeming work. And at the core of this sacrament is God's loving relationship with us. I've always been a person who wants to know the meaning behind things. I'm always wanting to know, but what does it mean? Why do we do this? What's the essence of it? What are the connection points to it? It's never really worked for me in religious life when I've asked questions and I've said to people, well, why do we do this? And sometimes people would say, well, it's just what we do. And that may be okay for some people, but that's never really worked very well for me. I've got to know why. I've got to understand the meaning behind it. Sometimes, to be honest, I feel a little bit like an outcast. And sometimes in our culture, I feel like we don't have much patience for trying to pursue this depth. It seems sometimes in our culture, we just want to know what's in it for me. Is there any money in it for me? What's the profit margin? Is there any personal benefit? But the meaning to me is, well, I guess where the meaning is. So that's what we're going to be getting at in what I hope is a really helpful way. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is the Apostle Paul rendering the communion experience. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's the apostle Paul explaining to us. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So think about Jesus' words. He says, this is my body given for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. I can't help but have these words come to mind. I love you. I miss you. Don't forget me, I'll be back soon. So much coalesces and collides in this sacrament of communion. Some traditions of the church call it the Eucharist, the expression of thanks. It is not only Jesus who we are remembering here, but Jesus as the very centerpiece of all that God is doing in his redeeming work in the world. It starts with Israel, moves us through the history of God's redemption and his relationship and our adoption, and it points us toward what is coming one day, the consummation of this relationship, the wedding feast of the Lamb. 
So let me take us on a bit of a historical tour of how communion roots us in the history of what God has done in his people Israel. You may know that God began his relationship with his people Israel through one man named Abraham. And he solidified this relationship with Abraham through the expression of a covenant. This covenant was the seal of the relationship that they had. In the book of Genesis, we're told that God spoke to Abraham and called him to make a sacrifice and an animal would be sacrificed, truly cut in two and laid in the two halves on the ground. And in this blood covenant expression, two people would pass through those two halves of the animal laid on the ground and some very, very important expressions were conveyed. One of them was, you might imagine it was bloody, that's true. One of them was, may what happened to this animal happen to me if I should break my side of this covenant. Secondarily, when the two parties in this covenantal practice would stand on either end of this animal sacrifice and they would pass through and they would pass one another and they would go to the other side. And what they conveyed in the sacred significance is this covenant is so significant that it validates and expresses that I will take your place and you will take mine. So this is the beginning of this covenantal relationship as we have it laid out as God calls Abraham and he calls Israel to be his people. Blood, yeah, there's always blood. I think for modern Americans, we have a very different relationship with blood than people would have in those days. For most of us, we're squeamish about it. We don't pay much attention to it. We wish it away. We turn our heads away. In Leviticus chapter 17, the Bible tells us, for the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life the blood of the sacrifice that makes atonement for one's life. We get this in Leviticus and it gives us kind of a partial understanding. We kind of get the concept, but only later on will we see it grow to its full fruition. It's long fascinated me that this statement in Leviticus from thousands of years ago says, for the life of a creature is in the blood. I'm gonna guess that almost all of us one time or another have been to the doctor we had something going on, whether you even needed just a routine physical or something more. And usually what the doctor will do is say, I want to run some blood tests. I want to run a panel to study what your blood tells us about what's going on with you. And almost always it is the studies of the blood that begin the diagnoses and the fuller understanding of what's going on. In Leviticus 17, for the life of a creature is in the blood. So let's talk a bit about this covenant relationship. It's essential to understanding the big picture. A covenantal relationship of love like this is very much analogous to a marriage as we understand it. This relationship would be exclusive. God called Israel to be his people exclusively. He didn't call all people to be his people because love has an exclusivity woven into it but we'll see how all people are invited into this love. But let me explain it to you for a moment. I couldn't say to my wife, I love you dearly while I am simultaneously also with a bunch of other women. You would all know, we would all know that that love is nullified by the fact that it's not being kept exclusively toward her. So when God calls his people Israel into this relationship with him, it's exclusive because the essence of love has this exclusivity built into it. You are my true beloved, my chosen one, and faithfulness to you is part of the core of this covenantal relationship. But the next thing about this kind of love is that it is marvelously expansive. This true love has the desire to create and have children. You understand the metaphor. And so Israel would be God's faithful relationship and Israel would be the one through whom God would bring many, many millions of spiritual children into his family. 
So on the one hand, it's exclusive. On the other hand, it's expansive. And we begin to see the picture get even clearer. This covenantal relationship, like a marriage, is exclusive, it's expansive, it's committed, it's faithful, it's forever. This is the nature of God's relationship with his people. This is what he wants us to know about his love for us. I love you. I miss you. Don't forget me. I'll be back soon. Okay, so we begin with Abraham. Let's move along a little bit in what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures to the Passover experience. The Hebrew people had been captive in Egyptian captivity for many, many years. And finally, the time came where God would release them from this captivity by punishing the sin of the Egyptians. What he told his people Israel is, I will send my spirit to bring punishment to the sin of the Egyptians. And yes, that punishment will mean death. But you, to avoid that death, to be protected from that wrath, are to sacrifice a lamb and place the blood of the lamb on the door frames of your house. Here we have that blood again. Yes, for the life of a creature is in the blood. And this is the level by which forgiveness and atonement happens. So God would tell his people, this expression of faith, of trusting me, you should sacrifice this animal. You have the sacrifice again, and you should place the blood on the door frame of your home. And this would be the protection from the wrath of God against sin. And then after this Passover night, God identified and called his people out of Egypt. This is the liberation. So you see the pieces starting to fit together. You get the forgiveness and the protection of wrath, and you get the liberation that comes by being God's people. After this incredible moment in the history of Israel, God would tell his people, I want you now to have a Passover meal, and I want you to celebrate this annually. Every year, I want you to come together to be reminded, to be re-rooted in who I am as the God who loves you and protects you from sin and who liberates you. And he tells his people to do this as families, but all families as part of the larger family of God's love for Israel. And so the Passover is an essential core part of what our communion sacrament means. So let me take a moment and just give you a little rest stop for a second. In a Jewish wedding, there's a moment where the bride and the groom come together and they hold a cup of wine. And the officiant who's marrying them, the rabbi, places his stole over them. And they drink from this cup of wine as the first starting point of their covenantal relationship with each other. This has been part of the fabric of Jewish weddings as long as anyone can remember. Hold that thought and we come to Jesus with the disciples in the upper room. You've probably heard it called the Last Supper. It was the Passover meal when Jesus gathered with the disciples. It was that Thursday night in Jerusalem. Imagine the flickering candlelight. Imagine the table with the food on it. In those days when people ate meals like this, they would recline, usually meaning lay on the floor and prop themselves up on an elbow. It wasn't at a table with chairs the way we do it. It was intimate and it was together. And usually there was a common bowl in the middle of the table and everybody had bread. And the way you would eat is that you would dip your bread into this common bowl. There would be conversation and laughter as everybody was gathered around the table in this place of protected and secure intimacy. It was in this environment when Jesus was with the disciples for what we call the Last Supper. Perhaps we'd be better to understand it as the First Communion. And so now Jesus is at the table and we're told in the scriptures that he takes bread and after giving thanks, he breaks it and he says, this is my body for you. For sure, the disciples would have understood that this is connected back to the covenantal relationship and the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. 
This is my body, which is given for you, Jesus would say. And the following day, less than 24 hours later, Jesus would go to the cross and his body would be sacrificed. His blood would be shed. The full and final forgiveness of God's acceptance of expanding the family to all people who would place their faith and their trust in Jesus. Now, after that, in the meal, it says he took the cup from the table. The Passover meal had ceremonial cups on it. Among them were the cup of wrath. We've spoken about God's wrath to punish sin, the cup of praise and thanksgiving, and the cup of redemption. It's clearly understood by commentators that when it says Jesus took the cup, he picked up the cup of redemption. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Remember the Jewish wedding with the cup. Remember the cup and the drinking being the union of the bride and the groom. Remember that God has called his people to be his bride way back to the time of Abraham and the beginning of Israel. So Jesus pours the wine and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for you. And when you drink this wine with a sincere expression of faith, you have the family blood in you. You may have heard me say this before, but many Christians, I think, struggle to believe that they're truly children of God, that they're truly in the family, that God truly and completely loves them, accepts them, and embraces them as children of God. In John 1:12, it says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The language is adoption language. It's legal language. It's the kind of language that was used to make it very clear that this is a full legal adoption, a done deal, sealed, lasting, and true. Sometimes people who have been adopted come to a time in their life where they wonder, am I really a member of the family? I don't have the family blood in me. And the parents will say, you are a member of the family because of our love for you. But sometimes there's a bit of a crisis. And I think many, many people who have been in church for maybe all their lives wonder about this from time to time. And they say, God, am I truly a member of the family? Am I really a child of yours? I don't have the family blood in me. But now you begin to realize part of the beauty and the power of the sacrament. If you come to the sacrament and you drink this juice with a sincere faith, Jesus is saying, this is truly me. Spiritually, yes, but truly, yes. And if you have a sincere faith and you drink that juice, you have the family blood in you. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God who shed his blood for us, now, by faith, he is living inside of us. Passover collides with the wedding idea the wedding idea is about this covenant and the renewal of it. So every time Jesus is saying, do this in remembrance of me, he wants us to be reminded of this union, this covenantal relationship we have with him, that he will never forget us. And he's calling us to never forget him by continuing to remember and rehearse those things that he's done for us. In Matthew 26, Matthew renders the Last Supper this way. He says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it, and then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to God for it, and he gave it to them, and he said, each of you drink of it, for this is my blood, ready, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Tim Keller, in some of his writings, speaks about the Jewish festivals as covenant renewal ceremonies, and particularly that God calls his people to the Passover meal as a covenant renewal expression. It's not just a meal, it's a holy and sacred placement of our hearts by faith in this relationship with God. And when we now come to communion, which started in the Passover meal and now grows into the fullness of the redemption of Jesus' blood shed for us, this is indeed a covenant renewal ceremony that every time we would take communion with a sincere faith, which is an essential component, this is a renewal of our covenantal relationship with God. A sidebar, which I find beautiful in this marriage analogy, in their book, The Meaning of Marriage, Tim and Kathy Keller say, among a married couple, their lovemaking is a covenant renewal ceremony. 
the holy sacred union. And so when we come to the communion table, Jesus wants us to be reminded of this relationship we have with him, a relationship that is faithful and that is committed and that is exclusive and that lasts forever. I'm reminded that it was an act of eating when sin entered the world way back in Genesis. And so it is an act of eating, of taking the elements at the communion table that is the expression where our redemption comes forth. In John chapter 6, Jesus is saying to the disciples, truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Rooting back to Leviticus, the life is in the blood. Jesus saying, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. It was an act of sin when Adam and Eve ate from the apple in the garden when they denied their trust in God. It's an act of eating when that happened. There's no doubt in my mind that part of the beauty of this sacrament is that it is an act of eating that is a full circle restoration of God redeeming us when we come to him with a sincere faith. And finally, the exchange of what happens at the communion meal. You remember in the covenant, the two parties would pass through the sacrifice, one taking the other's place. In John 14, 6, Jesus was teaching the disciples and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except, how about this word, except through me. So now we see that Jesus would be the sacrifice. We come to God the Father through Jesus. Him taking our place of sin and he takes the wrath. We get his place of forgiveness and we get the peace and the security and the protection from sin. And finally, I wanna close by saying in Revelation chapter 19, we get a picture of the wedding feast of the lamb. I don't know about you, but when I see all of this, the meaning of it is explosive as all these different scriptures start tumbling and coalescing together into what's happening in God's relationship with us, his people. It says, I heard a sound like the roar of a great multitude, like the rushing of many waters, and like a mighty rumbling of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory, for the marriage of the lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. She was given clothing of fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen she wears is the righteous acts of the saints. And then the angel told me, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb it all started back with abraham and this covenant relationship moving forward through the passover and the festivals and god's work of redemption finding its full centerpiece in jesus christ's death and resurrection and now the anticipation of what's to come the wedding feast of the lamb what i want to say is when we come to the communion table we are, in a sense, entering a slice of eternity. We're remembering the past rooted in the Passover. We're experiencing the present as fully adopted children of God, and we're anticipating the future, the full redemption at the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's a timeless moment. God's saying to us, I love you. I am always faithful to you. Don't forget me. I'll be back soon. Please join me as we pray. Lord God, our Father, would you help our hearts open up to the fullness of what you want us to know about your love for us? And Lord, would you meet us as we come to this sacrament? Would you meet us and draw our hearts in new and beautiful ways to be open to the fullness of your love? For those who feel insecure, who have wondered, am I really in the family? Holy Spirit, will you make this message secure in their hearts? If you take this sacrament with sincere faith, you have the family blood in you. And now, Lord, I pray, would you meet us as we enter this holy space, remembering the past, celebrating the present as adopted children of God, anticipating the future of the wedding feast of the Lamb, 
all colliding together in this one place, this beautiful sacrament. Thank you, Lord, for this gift. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're at home and you'll be joining in with communion, in a moment I'm going to break the bread, and when I do, break the bread that you've got simultaneously. And then I'll pour the juice and you pour simultaneously as well. And then I'll make it clear and I'll take a piece of the bread and invite you to join me so that even though it's virtual, we're all doing this together as a family of God. A.W. Tozer was kind of an old school minister in Chicago a long time ago. He had this beautiful little line. He said, for communion to happen, first you have to have union. If there's going to be communion, you have to have an initial union. This is a personal invitation from Jesus, this table. It's bursting with God's love for us, for you and for me. And maybe you are at a place in your life where you know, I've made a mess of it. Lord God, I need you in my life. I want to ask you to forgive me of sin. And Jesus, I need you as Lord and Savior in my life. Or maybe you're in a place where you know that you need to be reminded and come back again to this full status of being a child of God. So in a moment, I'll invite you to pray with me to truly open your life to God because all of that which I've just talked about, it's an incredible expression from God, but its meaning only happens for us when we have a sincere faith. Many of us have gone to church for years and years and taken communion with no sense of what it's all about. We just did it because it's the church thing to do. But a sincere faith is where we enter this union and this beautiful relationship with Jesus Christ. So join me as we get ready to break the bread and, and pour the juice. It was on the night of the Passover meal when Jesus was betrayed, when he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he took the cup from the table. Remember, among the cups on that Passover table, he picked up the cup of redemption, that through Jesus Christ, God would draw people to him through the forgiveness of sin. And holding that cup of redemption, pour with me, Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me, in remembrance of Jesus, in remembrance of who Jesus is, remembrance of his forgiveness, his love, his sacrifice, his resurrection, and his promised return. So participating in communion is a true faith experience with God. So if you know that you're in a place in your life where God is speaking to you and it's time to open your heart to say yes to Jesus Christ. I'm gonna invite you to pray with me now, let's pray. Lord God, as I come to this table today, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin and please forgive me through Jesus Christ's death on the cross and draw me into this new life through his resurrection and the promise of adoption. And now, Jesus, I receive you into my life as Lord and Savior, right now and forever. Amen. That prayer, simple as it is, if prayed with sincerity, is how we come in to all of this beauty and the promise that God has offered us. So join me as we take the bread, Jesus' body broken for us, his death on the cross. And now the new covenant and his blood, which is shed for us. And what is it that we do when we remember Jesus this way? We remember God's love and faithfulness. We remember Jesus' love and healing and forgiveness, his sacrifice and his promise to return. We remember that we are rooted as children of God. We are not adrift in the world, as strange as the COVID world may seem. 
You are a child of God, a full member of the family with the family blood in you. You are not alone, you are a member of his family. This expansive family that's inviting more and more and more people into it, because that's what love does. And we have the anticipation of heaven, the wedding feast of the lamb. The only logical result is that we would say, oh, Jesus Christ, thank you, thank you, thank you. So join me now as we close out with just a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll pray to conclude our time at communion and then offer the benediction to finish our service together. Let's pray. God, here we are, your children, gathered at this sacred sacrament, both celebrational and sobering, as we consider both the cost to make it possible and the joy of the union with you that is its intent. Lord God, we thank you so much for all that you've done. Jesus, we see now more clearly than ever that you are the centerpiece of all of this redeeming work of God, starting in his people Israel and growing to reach as many people everywhere as possible. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. We will never be able to thank you enough. You've forgiven us, you've given us new life, you've made heaven our home. You've given us community and you've given us a root system that holds our lives together. Lord Jesus, we'll never be able to thank you enough. Receive our thanks, Lord. Thank you, thank you. And now help us go, Lord, in the beauty of what it means to be renewed in this covenantal relationship and reminded that this is a real thing, a sure thing. This is of you. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay, everybody, as, as you go into your week this week, my hope is that all of us will have a rich and deep and beautiful sense of what this all means for us, that we're not living anonymous strangers in an isolated world, but adopted children of God loved with a faithful love. I love you. I miss you. Don't forget about me. I'm coming soon. So now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit who's working in your life and who's whispering to you in every moment and every circumstance, those that are happy and those that are really hard, the Holy Spirit is whispering, come closer to your Father in heaven. He loves you beyond your wildest dreams. Amen, everybody. Hope you have a great week.